Let's praise him for being the great I am. God, we just glorify you this morning. We praise you. God, that the great I am would want a relationship with us is beyond our imagination, beyond our understanding. God, we pray that you are glorified this morning and will continue to be glorified in this place, in our lives, in our worship, in our words. God, we love you and we thank you for this time together. It's in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So if you are new to Crossroad, if you're newer to our church, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here and just want to again just say welcome. So glad that you've joined us today. We are continuing in a series that we kicked off last week called Loving the 904, as in the 904 area code. All of our neighbors around us in Jacksonville, throughout Northeast Florida and beyond around the world as we are seeking to follow Jesus's command to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, to love our neighbors as ourselves. We have been praying and just feeling so strongly that in these days where we are experiencing some division and some divisiveness, that now more than ever, Jesus' teachings are needed to love one another, to love our neighbors. Church, are you with me so far? Yes, it just feels so right and so needed and so important for us to be the standard bearers of the cross, is to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus in the world around us. We got to do that yesterday, actually. We had a community trunk or treat right outside. Yeah, it was just awesome, just awesome. Just a glorious day. We safely gathered outdoors. We're able to bless so many of our neighbors. I want to say two things. First, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. People just, just, it was like candy from heaven. People bringing donated candy, because we all know that's exactly what kids need they, these days is more sugar and more screens, right? Not. But thank you for bringing the candy, and thank you for decorating your cars, and for serving in so many ways, running the, the, the games that we had going, and, and helping to provide food and water, and then helping to clean up after it was over. Just awesome. And so I wanted to say thank you. The second thing I want to say, though, connected to the trunk or treat, is some of you might be here in worship right now because you came to our trunk or treat yesterday. Maybe you're tuning in online right now on Facebook Live because you were here as one of our guests yesterday. So church, how do we feel about that, by the way, that we might have some people in our midst that came yesterday. And if you are looking for a church home, a place to belong, and you don't mind if it's an imperfect church full of imperfect people, we would love to be your church home here at Crossroad. And so please continue to worship with us. And we have some exciting things coming up. So let me run through a few of these things, and then we'll dive into our message today. So one thing you need to know if you're just jumping in is as part of our Loving the 904 series, I gave you a challenge Last week, I challenged everyone who calls Crossroad home, if you would do one random act of kindness for a stranger every week, starting last week, now, and it runs through Thanksgiving. Is this, so this series will take us all the way to one of my favorite seasons of the year, the season of Advent, which helps us get ready for Christmas. So would you jump on that train with us? Would you do one random act of kindness, just some act of service, blessing, love, kindness to someone God might put in your path? Uh, and just do one a week, and we're going to keep that going through Thanksgiving. Next thing I want you to know about is that we are receiving donations for a wonderful organization called Mission House, which is out at the beaches. We are coming alongside. They have a ministry with the homeless community, and there are some specific clothing items that they need. One of the things they do that we thought was just so neat is they provide a shower and a fresh set of clothes, underwear and clothes. Um, There's a particular need for homeless men, 
And some of you I know brought that with you to church this morning. Thank you so much. It's not too late. We're going to collect again uh, next Sunday on November the 8th. And we've got a donation spot out uh, by the front doors. And if you want to find out exactly what's needed, you can just stop by and see my friend Tracy at that. Is it Tracy, are you in the room? Can I do that? Can I put you on? Okay, great. I'm just making sure it's too late now. So see her after. She will let you know exactly what's needed so that you can kind of go out. And if you want to add that to your shopping list uh, and bring that with you to church next Sunday, bless some of our homeless uh, w- would be great. Next thing is uh, if you are looking to get connected at Crossroad, you want to meet some new people, we have Loving the 904 uh, online, safe online small groups that are going to meet once a week uh, just during November. Um, So it's not a huge commitment, but it is a huge opportunity for you to meet some people and get get more connected with our church. Those groups are kicking off this week. You can jump into one of those groups. You can can do that today. Same place, same person. Again, you just talk to Tracy and she she and the team will get you plugged in uh, this week uh, to one of those groups. If you are watching online, want to be in an online group, um, we, can, we can help you. You can go to our website, crossroad.church slash groups, I think is what it is, and we can get you uh, plugged in. Next, we have a Loving the 904 guide with tons of practical ideas and suggestions. So we've done all of this work for you, and our team put together this amazing guide. You can find it on our website. You can download that. You can see it on your phone, and it's just filled with all kinds of ways uh, that you can go out and be salt and light. You can go be the hands and feet of Christ uh, in our city and around our community. It's really, really great. You need to check it out. And the last one uh, I want to throw in here, and then I promise my commercial will be over, is uh, we, are, uh, we are a voting uh, precinct uh, for, for this area of our city. We feel that this is a wonderful way for Crossroad to use our, our wonderful facility and building to, to serve uh, our community. We're a big believer in everyone. Please get out and vote if you haven't done so already. We're a big believer in everyone using your, vi- uh, using your right to vote. And so one of the things I want to offer to you who might happen to have some free time on Tuesday, based on early voting numbers, we are expecting a huge, massive turnout uh, on, on Tuesday, which is a wonderful thing for Election Day. What this means, though, is we might have some very long lines of neighbors uh, extending out into our parking lot all day on Tuesday. We want to bless some people with cold bottles of water. We thought would be a, would be a fun way for us to love the 904. If you want to help us do that, at any point on election day, uh, so in two days, on Tuesday, um, same spot, that mission house drop off by the front doors um, after the service, uh, talk to us uh, and we will uh, put you on the crew of volunteers that are just going to hand out some cold bottles of water uh, to, our, to our neighbors who are coming, coming around. If you're watching online, if you're not in the room right now and you want to be a part of that effort of just blessing people with water, you can call the church office tomorrow. So it's 448-1288. That's the number. Call the church office tomorrow we will get you uh, plugged in. All right, so today we're continuing in our series called Loving the 904. So we uh, are going to take a look this morning at a story. It comes right after Jesus sends out his disciples on their very first mission trip. Now, when I was 15 years old, my life was changed forever by being a part of a team of people who went out just to go serve, to be the hands and feet of Christ. And sometimes we call that kind of being on a mission team or a mission trip, because you're going on a trip, but it's not a vacation. You're going with a mission to serve people in Jesus' name. And so this was Jesus sending out the disciples on possibly the very first Christian mission trip ever. These people had been called by Jesus, these disciples in this small but growing group of followers. They had heard Jesus teach. They had seen Jesus perform miracles but they didn't realize Jesus was about to flip the script and basically say, your turn. All the stuff you've been kind of watching me do and, you know, and taking the, picture, the pictures and doing the TikToks of all the stuff Jesus was doing, he was about to say, now it's your turn. Now you're going to go do all of this stuff you've been tweeting about. All right, and so here's the story. I'm going to take us to Matthew chapter 9, and we'll pick it up in verse 35, and then I'll kind of teach us through it. So Jesus, there it is, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues, and announcing the good news about the kingdom. Now, I want you to keep track with me. There's three things it's going to say that Jesus is doing. So the first one is this teaching. So Jesus is teaching. Second one, you see where it says announce the good news. Your Bible might use the word uh, preach or proclaim. So proclaiming good news that through Jesus, all people have access to God. And then here comes number three. And he healed every kind of of disease and illness. These three things, teaching, proclaiming, healing, three things. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Abby, you still with me? 
Okay, just making sure. All right, just making sure my daughter's listening. All right. So in the next verse, he keeps going. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Read the last part with me. Ready, go. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. All right, so let's leave this on the screen for a second. Let me explain kind of one of the many things that's happening here. So like I said, the first part of it, it talks about these three things that Jesus did. So think of that as like the what. This is what Jesus did. And then that next part, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. Matthew, the writer of this gospel, he's giving us the why behind the what. The why behind the what. This is what motivated Jesus to do what he did. Let's go to the next slide. I want to highlight three things for you. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Why? Because they were confused and helpless. Some Bible translations, that word confused, they say harassed. Because Jesus saw people who were harassed and helpless. The why behind the what. This is what motivates what Jesus does for the people. So if you were with us last week, we looked at a story that comes much later in Jesus' life. We looked at a story about when Jesus, he approached the, the city of Jerusalem just a few days before Jesus would be executed on a Roman cross. And Jesus, but I, I want you to, if you were with us last week, hopefully you're seeing kind of an echo of this. Because when Jesus approached Jerusalem, what did he see? He saw the crowds. And if you were with us last week, you remember what happens in Jesus' heart. When he, Jesus sees the crowds, he has compassion. Jesus' heart aches and breaks for these crowds. And why does Jesus' heart ache and break? Because they were confused and helpless. They were harassed, in other words, and helpless. I like to think that this is something, so we saw it last week and we see it here. I like to think that this is, this is like a pattern or a template for Jesus' ministry, is that this happened to Jesus again and again and again. He saw the crowds. He saw people. And when he saw people, especially people who were confused, harassed, helpless, Jesus feels this deep wellspring of compassion from deep within him for these, these people around him. See, Jesus taught us, just like I said last week, when it comes to people around us, we don't just look. That's a physical act, is looking. We don't just look. Do you remember, church? We see. We see. We don't just look. We see. It makes all of the difference. I have a good friend. His name's Wade. It's like a whole new world for him. Why? Because he got glasses. I'm wearing contacts right now. He's my brother from another mother, and, and I saw him this morning, and it's like, Kevin, I can see. He, he told me, he said, I didn't even realize there were second hands on my watch. For the first time, I can actually see this. Now, it, it, we don't just look. We see, just like Wade, he's showing us what Jesus is trying to teach all of us. See, looking, it's a physical act, but seeing, well, that's a spiritual act that God does within us. And so now we're going to take it further this week. So you remember last week, now I've caught us up. Matthew gives us this really interesting and also really memorable image to describe what it's like to see people the way that Jesus saw people. Because Matthew said that the people were like sheep. Sheep. Someone make a sheep noise for me. Do I have any middle schooler? Oh, okay. You're all middle schoolers. All right, great. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Sheep. Now, this is the first century, and this is an agricultural society. And so what is that? Sheep are everywhere. They're dotting the hills, they're, the, the hillsides and the valleys. The, the sheep are kind of all over the place. I grew up in the suburbs of Fort Lauderdale. I did not see a lot of sheep where I grew up. But later, when I lived in Kentucky, there were lots of farms in central Kentucky. And yes, there were lots of horse farms, but there were also farms all around that had sheep. And when Ashley and I would kind of go driving on those back roads, you could see it all around us. And I discovered there that sheep are not very bright. And I hope we don't have any sheep in the room right now. They're dumb. Sheep are actually very, very dumb. This is why you never see a sheep as a service animal or a companion <laughs> therapy. Well, I don't know, though. The way the things I've been reading in the news about the things people are bringing on planes, the, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to see that now. So to me, a sheep is like a companion animal on a plane. I don't know. You know, there's this new craze out there, apparently. I had to look this up because I am, I, I guess, what they call an elder millennial. And so I don't know the Snapchat. I don't know these things. I had to look this up. There's this new craze called goat yoga. Anyone heard of this? 
Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, this thing called, okay, here's everyone else that's normal like me. Here's what this is. Goat yoga is where goats stand on the back of people who are doing yoga. You cannot make this kind of stuff up. But notice what it's not. It's not sheep yoga. Because sheep are dumb. Remember this saying word. They, the sheep, they, they, they can't even apparently stand correctly, correctly enough to join in any of the yoga games. So sad, like all of the goats. No, sheep just have to bah, and watch while the goat yoga is happening. Because sheep without a shepherd, they will, uh, this is true, they will literally just roam around in circles shepherdless sheep, and then they will wander off into very dangerous situations. They don't know better. And to make matters even worse, this almost seems unfair, is that the way that that God has created them is sheep are very, very defenseless. They cannot run fast. They have no claws. They cannot climb very well. This is why Jesus tells us a story later on of a lost sheep. Do you remember that story? A lost sheep. Apparently, in the first century, this was a very, very common occurrence. But the problem and the point is that Jesus is describing not only the people around him. Guess who else Jesus is describing? Me, you, us. That's right. Jesus is describing us. So let me make it personal for a second. Without Jesus shepherding my life, I can be like a sheep and just start... (laughs) wandering aimlessly, (laughs) wandering aimlessly and purposely throughout my day and my life. You know what else can happen for me too when Jesus is not shepherding my life? You know what else can happen? Is I can find myself trapped in some very bad situations because of my own poor choices. Are you with me now, church? Without Jesus as our good shepherd and guide, things can go very badly for us. But thankfully, the Bible says that just like a good shepherd, Jesus sees you and me in our moments of confusion and in our moments of helplessness, in our moments of feeling even harassed by forces around us. And when Jesus sees us in that state, remember the point from last week and this week, Jesus sees you and me with eyes. He doesn't look at us. He doesn't point at us. No, he sees us with eyes of compassion. And do you remember the the thing I just read from Matthew 9? The three things, this trio of things. Remember, we're talking about the why behind the what, but the what Jesus does for us. Three compassionate acts. He teaches, he proclaims, he heals. He teaches us the way. He proclaims for us the truth of God's word, and he heals us for new life. The way, the truth, the life. Yet another way that the Bible describes Jesus for us. And just as Jesus sees us, Because Jesus never wastes a teaching opportunity, does he? He's also modeling for you and I the way that you and I are to see and respond to people around us who are confused and helpless and even harassed. You know, this word compassion shows up here. I love it. It comes from this Greek word, (laughs) splachnon. And it literally means what it sounds like. Splachnon means from the guts. (laughs) This is how the Greeks describe this emotion, this this compassion. See, for them, it didn't come from the heart. For them, it comes literally from the guts, something that comes from deep within us and propels us out into action. It explodes out of us with this, this passion and this energy to do something. That's compassion. That's the biblical version of compassion. It propels us not just to cry, but to do something about it to step in and to help and to rescue and to remedy. It's this energy to go out and do something about the brokenness of the world around us. And Jesus tells us exactly where all of this begins is to pray. I know you didn't see that coming. (laughs) Is to pray. You know, for centuries, um, fully devoted Christ followers, people that we would look to from the lens of history as people who are very, very close to God, have told us again and again and again that that prayer doesn't prepare us for the work of God. Prayer is the work of God. That Jesus tells all of us it it, it begins in this place. Now, for those of you who are wired toward action, 
And wait a minute, Pastor Kevin, you had been when you were talking about doing something about the brokenness of the world. But now if you're going to go off in this whole prayer kind of thing, and if you're there, that's okay. I'm glad you're worshiping. Just stay, just hang with me because, because we're going somewhere really powerful, really fascinating. Because prayer ignites in me compassionate action. Let's bring that up on the screen. Would you say that line with me out loud? Ready? Go. Prayer ignites in me compassionate action. It ignites in me compassionate action. And in you too. All right, so here's what Jesus tells his followers. You saw this a second ago, but I want us to see it again. And I believe when it says that Jesus is talking to his disciples here, I believe it means his modern day disciples as well, that this isn't just the first century. This is you and I today. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So, and what's the next word in the text? There it is, pray, pray. We see with Jesus' eyes of compassion, the very first thing is we pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. And then he says something interesting. He says, when you pray, here's your prayer request. Here's what Jesus is texting into our prayer line right now. Ask him, God, the Father, to send more workers into his fields. Now, for a long time in my own discipleship, I misunderstood this verse. I thought that Jesus wanted me to go pray for the harvest to pray just for all of the needs that I saw around me. And I would say, too, that this is not a bad thing at all for us to pray for the needs of people around us. But notice that this is not what Jesus challenges us to do here. Jesus' focus, before he sends the disciples out on their first mission trip, is to, to pray not just for the harvest, but to pray for harvest workers, to pray for harvest hands, in other words. Jesus understood that the issue is never the harvest. The issue, when it comes down to it, is whether or not there are workers. There are workers who would actually join in with this work of harvesting. And I think another paraphrase of this verse, it really brings it to life. Go to the next slide, and here's what it says. What a huge harvest! Jesus said, this is the same, same two verses. What a huge harvest, Jesus said to his disciples. How few workers, on your knees, and pray for harvest hands. Oh, I love that. Jesus knows that when his followers, when you and I, when we learn to start to pray in this direction, praying for, for harvest hands, that the Holy Spirit, it ignites within us. It's like this divine power and courage, this boldness for us to go follow Jesus' lead. It's this thing that sometimes we kind of feel this, this kind of thing or this power, this presence in us. Sometimes when, like when Kenny and Sonia and the band were leading these worship songs and I was here in the front row and I'm watching this and I'm hearing your voices and also hearing the voices, all of you worshiping online, singing in all homes across Northeast Florida and beyond, it ignites kind of this boldness and this, it lights this fire deep within us. But what we're talking about right now is that it doesn't have to be limited to one hour on Sunday morning. Is that it's this boldness and this power that it's, it's what are we doing Monday through Saturday, not just when we gather like this for a church service together. See, the Holy Spirit ignites this in us because prayer ignites in us, remember the point, compassionate action. Compassionate action. And we must never lose sight of the harvest for what it is. That the harvest is people. People, of course, are not plants or crops. <laughs> they are not projects. People are not targets. People are created in the image of God, and they are the object, not of our outreach, not of our evangelism, not of our ministries. People are the object of God's immeasurable love and grace. That's the foundation that we build everything else on. God's grace is already at work, already at work in people's lives. How many times have you heard someone kind of say, I didn't realize it back then, but even there, even then, God was at work in my life. I've heard that so many times. Some of you even told me that's your testimony and your story, is looking back now as, as a follower of Jesus, realizing that God had gone far before you were already or aware of what God was doing in your life. It's like looking back in the, rear, the spiritual rear view mirror of your life and realizing that God's grace was there. God's grace was already at work, reaching out to you and me, drawing us closer. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe this book to you is just a bunch of fairy tales. Maybe you're not sure God exists at all. First, I would say thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. As a questioner, as a skeptic, as an wherever, whatever, wherever you are. First, I would say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
And then second, I would just say, could it be that even you worshiping with us right now is, is part of God's grace at work in your life in ways that, that you're, you're still trying to comprehend? You're, you're chill, still trying to kind of, kind of sense, because the harvest is you and me, the harvest is people. We are objects of God's grace and love. And so how about this? Let's try to kind of bring this together and get practical with all this. What if this week, especially in light of this week, in this kind of cultural and societal kind of tension and even anxiety that's kind of in the air that people are experiencing kind of driven by the presidential election, what about in this moment when you are walking or driving in your own neighborhood, the mission field that God's given you, <laughs> what if as you're walking and driving, what if you just took some time to be prayerful, to allow Jesus to give you eyes to see with compassion the people around us who might be feeling confused or helpless or harassed, and, and, to, and, and just to put yourself in a prayerful place. I, I, if, you're, if you're driving through your neighborhood, do that with your eyes open, by the way. Don't pray with your eyes closed if you're driving. Maybe walking either, but to pray compassionately. And let me give you a couple of suggestions or prompts. What should we pray for? First, we could pray for people to experience the good news of Jesus in their life. We could pray for, 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 for God to just, to just start to go to work in that person's heart in their life, that people would come to know, that, that, that people would, would come to know this new and eternal life, that they would know freedom from, from sin and from death itself through a relationship with Jesus like so many of us right now have experienced that we could pray for other people to experience this same grace, this same love, this same forgiveness. Second suggestion, we could pray not only for that, but also for God to awaken those of us who know this love of Jesus to then join Jesus in the work of the harvest. Because yes, our world is confused and, and, and helpless in so many ways. But see, God's people, the Bible says, you and me, we actually have the opportunity to transform the culture around us. But remember what Jesus says in Matthew 9, God needs more workers. God's holding a job fair right now. He's, he's hiring. He's, he's taking all comers. It doesn't matter how ugly the, the, the resume looks or no resume at all. God, God is this amazing equal opportunity employer. He just kind of hires us and takes a huge risk and puts us to work. Because remember, the harvest is ready that it's the workers that God is looking for. Jesus invites us to pray for harvest hands. All right, so go back with me to, we were in Matthew chapter 9. Remember I said they were about to go on the very first mission trip. Let me tell you about that. This is Matthew chapter 10. It says Jesus, right after this moment of praying for harvest workers, harvest hands, Jesus called his 12 disciples and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to throw them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. Oh, this must have been such a good moment. The disciples, I'm sure, were like, oh, yeah, give me the power, Jesus. Pray over me, all that. They didn't realize he was about to say, now you're about to go out and do all of this. It must have been so funny for Jesus to do this to them. And here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Now, why does Matthew bore us with this litany of people? Oh, but it's so interesting, especially these little details Matthew gives us, these little qualifiers and descriptions he applies to the names of Jesus' mission team. Because whenever I read a passage of Scripture like this, for a long time for me, as I was getting to know Jesus better, my first move was to kind of disqualify myself and let myself off the hook. See, I, and maybe you too, we can easily participate in our own self-diminishment because I could say to myself this, well, I can't love that person like Jesus does. Jesus just needs to go love that person. <laughs> I don't have enough, and then I'd fill in the blank. You know, I'd even go through the list, well, I'm not like one of the disciples or one of the apostles. You know, I don't have enough love. I don't have enough patience. I don't have the money or the time. I don't have the, the expertise. I, sometimes for me, I don't even have enough faith to be able to kind of go do that kind of stuff. That's for the real Christians. Maybe you have your own list. But like I said, these details matter in this list because I want to tell you about who Jesus sends out in this passage. And yeah, we, we, we sometimes call them the apostles. Maybe you've seen them. They've got the pictures like the, oh, 
know, with the two fingers and like the, they, remember the halos didn't show up back then, but we see the pictures, they got the halos with the CGI around their heads and all of that. They have hospitals that are named after them now and universities and, you know, and they even start their name now. It's not just like Thomas, it's like St. Thomas and all that. But let me tell you the real story. Let me tell you kind of the, any, uh, like I said, elder millennial, VH1, the ring a bell, like the before they were famous. Let me give you some of that, okay? Peter was the, was the fully caffeinated disciple. He, he, would, he would talk first and think later about what he just said. He's the guy, he walked on water in faith one minute, and then just a few chapters later, after he walks on water, he's denying that Jesus, that he even knows Jesus at all. That's Peter. Next are James and John. They're called the Sons of Thunder. They didn't get that nickname because of their table manners and their etiquette and calligraphy skills. No, they were called the sons of thunder because they were so competitive and shrewd and conniving and manipulative that they once went to mommy and asked their mother if they could ask Jesus and arrange it and scheme it out so that they could sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand. They went like full politician on Jesus. That's James and John, sons of thunder. Next there's Matthew. Matthew was the Jewish tax collector who sold out his countrymen and went to work for the hated Romans. He would have been a very familiar face for all of the fishermen. There were multiple fishermen and like these small business owners who were in the group. He would have been a familiar face. Why? Because he made all of his money and he was rich extorting them and extorting their businesses on behalf of the evil Roman Empire. Alongside Matthew is Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot was part of a movement that advocated advocated rebelliously overthrowing and violently overthrowing Roman rule by any means necessary. Think about what that would have been like for Simon the Zealot to be on his camel right next to Matthew the tax collector on his camel, kind of walking around, walking around Judea together. And yes, of course, there's even Judas Iscariot, and we remember Judas, right? He was one of Jesus' very, very best friends. Maybe you've suffered through this before. One of Jesus' most trusted, loyal best friends who betrayed him and sold him out. But get this, even Judas Iscariot, Jesus, of course, knowing the betrayal that's coming, entrusts Judas, Judas, with full authority, hires him, signs him up to be one of his harvest hands. These are not the blue chip first round draft choices, my friends. You know, I got Jacksonville Jaguars fans in the room, right? These are like Jaguars draft picks. You with me? You with me now? Jesus went after all kinds of people, and then he included them on his team. I've heard it said before, there's a famous line that Jesus doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. The disciples were a ragtag group of mostly teenagers that were crazy enough and impetuous enough to say yes to Jesus' call to be like Jesus to imitate him. And guess what? That's still what Jesus does today. He calls you. He calls me to to love our neighbors, to be harvest workers, harvest hands. And instead of thinking about what we don't have, don't have the money, the expertise, the time, the energy, the health, instead of thinking about what we don't have, maybe we could focus on what we do have and on what we're called to share. We have a Savior Name Jesus, let's start there. Jesus, he sought us. Like the old hymn says, he bought us with his redeeming blood. We're called to share this news. The disciples learned this, and we can too. It's through our living, through our words, through our kindness, and yes, through our prayers, what we're talking about today, these prayers that ignite within us this compassionate action that we can help point people to the answer to their deepest soul longings and dreams. Hope has a name. Healing. So many people I know these days looking for healing, emotional healing, physical healing, relational healing. Healing has a name. Peace has a name. Joy has a name. Forgiveness has a name. Grace has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. And like no other time in my lifetime, perhaps even in the last century, these last hundred years, I believe that people need to know the name of Jesus. There's people all around us. It's walking through our parking lot. There's just so many neighbors and people turned up. Friends, there's so many people around us. They're like sheep without a shepherd. 
confused, helpless, even harassed. And they need someone who's simply willing to imitate Jesus' love for them and in their life. The question I need to ask myself and you too is, am I willing? Am I willing? Let's have Jesus' eyes that see with compassion, that see the confusion and the helplessness, and even just all of the harassment of people in our world. Maybe it's a person who might even live under the same roof as you. Maybe it's a neighbor who lives across the street. Maybe it's a homeless person that you pass by on a corner in your neighborhood or near your office or your workplace. And let's pray as Jesus taught us. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more harvest hands, starting with your hands and with my hands. Why? Because prayer ignites in me and you compassionate action. Let's bring that on the screen one more time. Say it with me, church. Humor me out loud. Go. Prayer ignites in me compassionate action. And maybe with the prophet Isaiah, the one who was asked by God, who will go for me? Maybe you and I will say, here I am, Lord. Send me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, as we seek to love the 904 uh, together, um, today we get to do that as a church family that becomes even more complete and even more whole because we're going to celebrate the confirmations of two of our young people. How cool is that? As they, yes, praise God. As these two young men who will be joining the ranks of many others as we've kind of gone through this season of confirmations, um, and to help us kind of if you're new to this or you're just visiting today, Gil Martin, our wonderful, faithful director of youth ministries. Thank you so much, Gil. Uh, Gil is going to come, and I've asked him if he would uh, kind of lead us into what, what's about to happen. Um, so, Gil, would you, would you help us? Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin, for that message. Morning, church. As Pastor Kevin said, we get the honor and privilege to celebrate two of our, our youth, our students, um, and celebrating their confirmation. Um, and if you haven't been with us the past few weeks, we've celebrated, um, this. these would be our 16th confirmations over the last several weeks. It's been amazing. Um, and confirmation for these students that they went through last year was just kind of an overview of what we believe as United Methodists and um, learning about so many things about um, the Holy Trinity, communion, baptism, about this beautiful gift of grace that God gives us. And now they get to be join and be a part of Crossroad Church and what it means to be um, to bring in this harvest, to go and be workers to fulfill the harvest of our church and be a part of that together. And are, aren't you excited with me? It's an amazing opportunity. So, All right. So let me invite our two confirmands. If you guys would stand in place right where you are. And let me give you guys the opportunity to, to claim and live into the baptismal vows that were taken on your behalf. So, do you in the presence of God in this congregation renew the solemn vow and promise that was made at your baptism? And if so, say, I do. Do you believe in God the Father and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Right. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, if so, say, I do. I do. All right. And according to God's grace that's given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's hands and feet in the world? And if so, say, I will. I will. All right. Now we'd like to invite up uh, T.J. Ballou and his family. <laughs> Mom made me write this down. I was going to wing it, but. So, TJ, Thomas James, as with your baptism a few years ago, confirmation is a mile marker on a lifelong journey of faith. The road is, is long with many a winding turn. 
Confirmation the musical next year will be huge. It'll be great. <laughs> it's a long, it's a winding road, but it leads us to the cross. It leads us to an empty tomb. It leads us to what Jesus calls life in abundance. And as you take up your cross and then follow Jesus, there will be a refining of your character which continues until you attain what the Apostle Paul called the fullness of Christ. Now, TJ, sometimes on this journey, you're going to feel all alone. There's nobody out there. There's nobody that cares. TJ, you are not alone. You are not alone in taking a journey of faith, and you're not alone in this journey of faith. While your journey is and will be different than your mother's or mine, along with us and the people here, There are those who have walked their journey with Christ before us, including your grandparents and many, many generations of your forebearers. The author of Hebrews tells us that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who attest to the faithfulness of God who never abandoned them. So never lose sight of the fact that you are a beloved child of God a person of worth so valuable that Jesus himself would say that you are to die for. So as you walk along this journey of faith, I offer you this blessing. May the Spirit of God be pleased to dwell within you so that the fruit of the Spirit will well up within you. May God sharpen your mind so that you'll have clarity of thought and insight into God's Word. May God temper your logic and reason with his wisdom and his compassion so that you may speak the truth in love with wisdom and with compassion. May God direct the passions of your heart to the purposes of the kingdom of heaven so that you will not chase after the wind or labor in vain, but you will store up treasures in heaven. May God strengthen your body so that you may carry the burdens of others wherever the Lord leads you to and for as long as he asks you to. May the peace of Christ guard your heart and your mind, and may God hold you in the palm of his hands all the days of your life. And TJ, on that day, will you stand at the throne room of heaven before the mercy seat, and you see your Savior face to face, I hope he gives you a great big smile and a great big hug. And he welcomes you home into the place that he has prepared for you. Thomas James Ballou, the Lord defend you with this heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we'd like to invite up Jacob Griffin and his family. suggested I sing, but I'm going to leave that to Paul. (laughs) Not embarrass Jacob too much. All right. Jacob, we are so proud to be standing here with you today as you take this next step in discovering your faith and your identity in Christ. You have always rushed to embrace life, always ready to try something new and meet challenges head on. When you were little, Abby would run away from Daddy Monster while you ran straight at him. You are wickedly clever and make us laugh until we cry. You are intelligent and have insightful observations about the world around you. You are loyal and steadfast. And once someone is lucky enough to have you as a friend, they have you for life. You are hugely compassionate and always quick to offer encouragement. I could keep going for quite a long time and make this even more embarrassing for you. But I will just say that you are also too hard on yourself. 
We do not expect you to be perfect, and neither does God. As you stand here today, or kneel, to be confirmed, we know that you still have questions. We know there will be moments and even seasons of doubt. That is when you lean in. Bring on the questions and invite the Holy Spirit in when you have doubt. And know that you are not on this journey alone. You will always have your family. Your dad and I, Abby and Nathan, Di and B, we are with you. And we are for you, cheering you on. And it's not just us. Your friends, your church are with you. You are surrounded by a great wealth of people who love you. And God will be with you every step. As you go forward in life, wherever you go, we pray that you lead with your compassion, that you encourage the downtrodden and our friend to the friendless. We pray that you remain faithful and loyal to God as he is always faithful and loyal to you. We pray that as you look at the world around you, you see as God sees. We pray that when you are faced with sadness, that you will meet it with laughter. We pray that when you rush forward in life, it is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But above all, we pray that as you go forward, you do so knowing this simple and profound truth, that you are a child of God and a person of worth. And if you lose sight of that truth, it is our honor and privilege to be there to remind you. We love each other. Jacob Daniel Griffin. The Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, I have, wait, I'm sorry, I have more to do. Um, <laughs> all right. So Jacob and TJ, now it's my joy to uh, lead you in your membership vow. Uh, for you to, to become the newest members of Crossroad Church. So let me ask you guys if you would stand up again right where you are and ask you this question. As members of Crossroad Church, will you faithfully participate in our ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if so, say, I will. I will. All right, so if you'd stay standing just for a second. As I say this to the rest of the church, my brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care these two young men, whom we this day receive into the membership of Crossroad. Will you do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love? And if so, I'm going to invite you guys to respond. So Jacob TJ, if you would turn around now, and if you look at all these people who love you, and church, would you respond to them with the words you see on the screen? We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you, in the body of Christ and in Crossroad Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And now, would, if you're able to, would you stand to your feet and let's welcome them into our church. to God's work through Crossroad Church. Remember, you can do that anytime at crossroad.church. We also happen to have giving boxes by the exits. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your financial support. And now before you go, would you receive this blessing? My brothers and sisters in Christ, this week, especially this week, would you pray for the 904? Would you pray for our nation? Would you pray for our world? Would you pray for our neighbors? And may it ignite within you compassionate action to go and be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.